Hello, my darlings, and welcome to an Art Witch Collab. I'm joining four other witchy content creators in making an art magic spell for healing and connection, as well as expressing the love and respect that I have for the land I live on. I'll be creating a bee house as my contribution to this Art Witch collaboration. Let's do some magical crafting. If the theme for this magical working resonates with you or inspires you, I encourage you to participate as well. You can create some sort of art witchery for healing and connection and post photos or videos of your creation with the hashtag ArtWitchCollab across social media. To begin with, I would love to introduce some other witchy creators participating in this collab. Hey everyone, I'm the Witchling. I am an archaeologist and an artist and of course the witch. Humans doing art has been as old as humanity itself. Honestly, it's like breathing for humans. So everybody can do art. Everyone can do art and everybody should. And I'm trying to teach you to bring more art into your life and into your craft. Hi, my name is Aurora from Lavender Hazelwood Witches. I do a lot of green hedge and really hearth witchery, I guess. And I've also been traveling the priestess path with her mystery school, and I'm especially drawn to our animal creature friends. I'm excited because Amy from Magical Crafting and I, since we're in the same part of the world, we've decided to collaborate in this collaboration and both do some workings around our pollinators and helping them out. So we are going to take a trip into the garden. Hi there, I'm Kara, host of Pagan Crafting. I'm a pagan art green witch with a little side of shamanka. I'm a holistic healer and a professional medium. I, my day job, I'm a shamanic art life coach and I like to bring all that into my channel. My channel is nature-based, seasonal-based, elemental-based and everything to do with the nature around us. I'm from Alberta, Canada and I like to incorporate what I live around me with my channel. So join me today if you like all things nature, spells, candles, crafts, you name it. Let's do it. Let's have some fun. Hello, Shamai. I'm Jessica. I'm an astrologer and folk witch living and crafting on my ancestral homeland of South Wales in the UK. My craft is mainly rooted in the land where I live and focusing on understanding and living in tune with the seasonal cycles and ebbs and flows with a big dose of creativity and art magic thrown in. I have a YouTube channel, Jessica and the Moon, where I share about my personal path and also tarot, journaling, lots of journaling because that kind of practical organization is very important to me living a practical everyday magical life i'm using an old wooden cigar box as my container my first step is to paint my container green in color magic green corresponds to nature growth fertility healing and abundance it's associated with the lushness of plants, the vitality of life, and the abundance of the natural world. It represents the power of nature, symbolizing growth, renewal, and the cycles of life. Along with paint, the main materials I'll be using for my project are paper and wood. Aurora from Lavender Hazelwood Witches is also doing a bee-themed project for this collaboration. We both live in Southern California, where there is extreme heat and drought conditions. But surprisingly, California leads the country as the largest producer of agricultural products. That makes pollinators one of the most important things to protect and care for. Caring for the bees is a wonderful way to connect with and heal the land. When we think about the buzzing visitors in our gardens, Honeybees often come to mind as the most common pollinators. However, it's worth knowing that honeybees are actually a non-native and invasive species of bee. Honeybees are not native to California where I live or even to the United States. They originated in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. European colonists brought honeybees to North America during the 17th century. Here in San Diego County, we're fortunate to have over 650 bee species, 
making it the most diverse bee population in the continental United States. And yet, many of us aren't aware of any of them. Unlike honeybees, our native bees don't live in hives or make honey. Most native bees are actually solitary and live underground, in hollowed out plant stems or in holes in wood. They also come in various sizes, from the large carpenter bees to bees so tiny you can barely see them. And they come in a variety of colors and sheens. We often don't realize that the little bug hovering around a flower is a bee and not a gnat. Of course, I always love to add glitter to all of my projects, so instead of sealing the paint with a plain gloss sealant, I chose to use one with glitter in it. The role of bees in our food system is incredibly crucial. In fact, it's been said that without them, humanity would only have four years left to survive. While technology has advanced and made it possible to artificially produce food, bees still play a significant role in shaping our diets and influencing the cost of many food products. Even simple foods like sunflower seeds and almonds are available in such abundance because of the dedicated work of bees. Native bees are also vital for the survival of plants that are native to our county and our state. Many of these plants have flowers that are too small for the larger honeybee, and they rely on our small native bees for efficient pollination. Honeybees, on the other hand, are better suited for large-scale crop pollination and can inadvertently disrupt native plant habitats. To decorate my bee house and add some sigil magic, I'm using an unfinished wooden hexagon shape to represent a beehive and an unfinished wooden bee. I'm painting them with acrylic paint and sealing them with a gloss sealant. You may ask, if honeybees are hive dwellers, what solitary bees might take up residence in my bee house? There are two species that are likely. Mason bees are a group of solitary bees that are native to North America, Europe, and Asia. Unlike honeybees, Mason bees are solitary, meaning they don't live in colonies or hives. Each female mason bee constructs and provisions her own nest independently. However, it's common to find multiple mason bee nests in close proximity, as they're not aggressive towards one another and can coexist peacefully. They are called mason bees because they use mud or clay to create individual chambers within pre-existing cavities like hollow stems, cracks in wood, or even man-made structures like bee houses. Each chamber is filled with a pollen and nectar mixture, and an egg is laid before sealing the chamber with more mud. This process is repeated multiple times, resulting in a series of neatly arranged chambers. Leaf gutter bees are also solitary bees that might decide to live in my bee house. Unlike other bees that use mud or wood for their nests, leaf cutter bees utilize pieces of leaves to build their nest cells. Females actively cut out small circular sections from leaves using their strong mandibles. These leaf fragments are then carried back to their nest location where they use them to construct cylindrical cells each cell is lined with pieces of leaves, creating a protective barrier. The, both of these species are excellent pollinators, anywhere from three to 10 times better at pollinating than the common honeybee. One fascinating aspect of mason bees is their emergence timing. They're among the first bees to appear in the spring, typically when temperatures begin to warm up. 
Their early emergence allows them to take advantage of early blooming flowers that other pollinators may not have access to at that time. And these solitary bees are generally gentle and docile creatures. They are not aggressive and rarely sting, making them safe and easy to observe. Even if stung, their stings are mild and generally pose little threat to humans. Due to their remarkable pollination capabilities and non-aggressive nature, these solitary bees are increasingly being recognized and appreciated as valuable pollinators in gardens, orchards, and agricultural settings. To add a bit of sigil magic to my project, I decided to create a sigil for the intention of our Art Witch collaboration, healing and connection with the land. I remove all vowels, leaving only consonants. Consonants are the manifesting sounds. If a consonant is repeated, I use it only one time. I'm left with H, L, N, G, D, C, T, W. I began with the letter C and the letter D, combining them to create a circle with a vertical line down the middle. Using the center line, I added the letter L and then created a sideways letter H. Again, using the center line, I added a line at the top of the circle to create the letter T. And I discovered the letter G in the sigil with the existing lines and curves. I added a W at the top and then deconstructed the letter N and used the three lines to draw a stylized star inside of the circle. I added some decorative dots, and here is my final sigil for the intention of healing and connection with the land. The land I live on in San Diego, California, is a place where the Kumeyaay Nation of First Peoples have lived for over 10,000 years. Following the rhythm of the seasons, migrating from coast to desert, to mountains, in a continuous dance to gather resources as the weather and land dictates. As I was considering my connection with the land, I had to consider the indigenous people of the region. The Kumeyaay traveled between Yuma, on the border between Arizona and California, all the way down to the San Diego coast trading with tribes, and gathering resources in their seasons. Every month, as I drive from San Diego to Yuma and beyond to visit family, I use one of the main migration and trade routes the tribes used. It is now called the Kumeyaay Highway, and it passes through many Native American tribal lands. As a San Diego native for several generations, my grandfather used the same road to drive a hay truck from the alfalfa farms in the Imperial Valley to San Diego. We travel in hours by car, a distance that took the first peoples weeks to traverse through the beautiful but austere desert and mountain regions filled with yucca and pinyon pines. Native pollinators such as bees, moths, hummingbirds, bats, and butterflies 
maintain the ecological balance of Southern California, ensuring the survival of agave plants, pinyon pines, and modern crops as well. Native bees are two to three times better pollinators than honeybees, and the decline of these pollinators has forced farmers to hire beekeeping companies for their crop pollination. They provide bees and hives for alfalfa, almonds, avocado, citrus, melons, and other crops. These hive boxes can be seen all along the Kumeyaay Highway, stacked in rows beside irrigated farmland in the Imperial Valley. The biggest threat to bees are pollution, pesticides, and the loss of habitat. As natural areas are replaced by buildings, roads, and manicured lawns, urbanization contributes to the loss of bee habitat. Urban environments lack diverse flowering plants and nesting sites for bees. Gardening with herbicides, pesticides, and the removal of weeds, which are important forage sources, negatively impacts bee populations. Many people underestimate the importance of native plants and instead plant non-native varieties in their gardens, and this leads to the decline of local pollinator species. But recently, in Southern California, there's been a revived interest in landscaping with native, drought-resistant plants, and some homeowners are removing their lawns and replacing them with hardy native alternatives. Unlike honeybees that live in colonies, solitary bees are non-aggressive and lead independent lives. A bee house is a container designed to mimic or simulate their natural nesting habitats. Bee houses are typically made of a series of small tubes or cavities that serve as nesting sites. These tubes are made from various materials, such as paper, cardboard, or hollow reeds. Each tube should be about six inches long, and the diameter can vary. The trendy drilled wooden blocks you often see in pre-made bee boxes are not recommended because they cannot be removed and cleaned each season to prevent disease. If this video inspires you to make a bee house of your own, I recommend you do some additional research on how to clean and maintain your house to keep it free of disease and to get use out of it year after year. I'm using Phragmite reeds for my bee house. These are similar to the bee's natural nesting material. I'm also using a reed beach mat to construct my house. I'm cutting it into four six inch wide strips. I'm also using cardboard paper tubes in my project, mixing and matching all three materials. When will bees move into my house? The likely answer is in the summer. Mason bees emerge during early spring when temperatures rise to the 50s and early flowers start to bloom. Leaf cutter bees show up at the beginning of summer. Bees mate during late spring through early summer, and they might move into my bee house during early summer. I chose a favorite corner of my backyard to place my bee house. It's covered in ivy and rosemary. The bee house should be placed against a flat surface and located in an area protected from high winds. Ideally, it should be between three to seven feet off the ground and not somewhere where it will get wet very often. The front of the house should have a south or southwest exposure where it will get the most sun in winter to keep the bees warm. The hive should be placed where it will receive the early morning sun. This gets the bees out of the house earlier in the day to forage. In the northeast, Bee houses can remain in the full sun for the entire season. However, in places with warmer climates like San Diego where I live, 
bee houses should receive some afternoon shade. When doing art witchery, it can often take several hours or several days to make a magical creation. It took me two days to complete all of the steps for this project, learning about bees, researching the best materials and sizes for the house, painting, sealing, and finishing, adding some sigil magic and filling the box, and finally creating a small sacred space in my yard to place it, doing every step mindfully with the intention of connecting with and healing the land I live on and creating a powerful, magical result. <laughs>